Good evening and welcome. My name is Gabriel Goldstein and I'm the interim director and chief curator at Yeshiva University Museum. I welcome you all here this evening on behalf of Yeshiva University Museum and the Center for Jewish History. Welcome those of you here in the auditorium with us, as well as the many of you who are watching us on live stream. We're really delighted you could all join us for this very special program in conjunction with Yeshiva University Museum's landmark exhibition, The Golden Path, Maimonides Across Eight Centuries. And when we first opened the exhibition and we're planning for the public programming for this exhibition, we began to discuss among ourselves and to think who would be the right person we could invite to be a public intellectual, to think about Maimonides in a broad way. And a number of us were like Simon Shama. And um, it was pretty kind of obvious that if we wanted to look at this topic um, in a kind of broader historical, and art historical, social cultural lens, that this would be the perfect way for us to consider this. And we're really delighted that Sir Simon has agreed to present for us this evening and to think about this topic in terms of Maimonides and medicine, um, I think a topic which is extra relevant to us as we all emerge from COVID. I just got my most recent inoculation. I yep, encourage all of you the same. Um, my wife is an infectious disease specialist, so um, I have a, a kind of an extra interest in this area. Um, I'm not sure that Simon Shama really needs an introduction to any of you um, in this room or those of you watching on your computer screens or telephones and, um, going forward. Telephones, that's something I wanted to bring up right away. All of you, please, take out your phones, put them on silent, turn them off. Um, Sir Simon is going to share with us some really wonderful insights and we don't want to hear any ringing. Um, so I ask all of you to make sure your phones are on silent um, or turned off before we start this evening's program. Um, a word of introduction, um, London-born, historian and scholar Sir Simon Shama is the university professor of both art history and history at Columbia University. Sir Simon previously taught at Cambridge, Oxford, and Harvard. Pretty good lineup. Um, Sir Simon, Sir Simon, was appointed commander of the order of the British Empire in 2001 and was knighted in the Queen's birthday honors in 2018. He is the author of 20 books and the writer and presenter of 60 documentaries on art, history, and literature for BBC television. He has received a vast range of awards, American Academy of Arts and Letters Award for Literature, the Kenyan Review Award for Literary Achievement, the Premio Antoni Petronelli Prize in Historical Sciences from the Academia de Lince in Rome, and there are more. Um, so Simon, and this is true to my own heart and to the museum, has curated exhibitions at the Whitechapel Art Gallery and the National Portrait Gallery. So to have a historian, a scholar, an art historian, a curator present for Yeshiva University Museum on this topic is um, multiple stars um, on, our, on our score sheets. Um, his work has been translated into 23 languages. I think he might beat Maimonides there, um, but Maimonides we know, and those of you who heard the tour or will come thereafter know about the translations of Maimonides into a range of languages. Um, this evening, he, we are delighted that he's able to join us to discuss this topic. Um, for this evening, Sir Simon will present his remarks initially, then we'll have an opportunity to raise some questions in a discussion with him. Um, I hope some of you have already received the index cards and pencils to write, jot down questions you might like to ask, and we will also distribute those um, at the end of the remarks for any of those who need them. And that's how we'll handle, we'll gather those, and that's how we'll handle questions. Following the program and following the lecture and the question and answers, um, you're invited to come outside to um, purchase my, um, Sir Simon's newest publication, which he will be kindly signing for any of you who wish, and also joining the exhibition tour of the Yeshiva University Museum, Maimonides exhibition. Um, for those of you who have registered and for those of you who haven't, um, we are very welcome that you can join our exhibition tour. And depending how it works, we'll give it a few minutes so you also can get your book purchased and signed. Um, and on that book, his 20th book, um, and the one which we will be the kind of the, in many ways, the source for the conversation this evening regarding Maimonides and medicine and Maimonidean in India, as the title says. The most recent book is Foreign Bodies, 
pandemics, the vaccines, and the health of nations. And that was published this year in 2023. So on behalf of Yeshiva University Museum and the Center for Jewish History, we could not be more pleased to welcome Sir Simon Shana. Hello. Um, thank you, Gabriel, for that really lovely introduction. But um, you know, hearing an account of everything I've got up to in um, my many misspent years makes me feel already exhausted, actually. However, I'm going to recover my energy and um, strength. So it's a, it's a fantastic pleasure to um, be here and to celebrate the exhibition and to invoke Rambam, I think especially amidst so much tragedy and pain in, uh, unfolding in the Jewish and indeed the non-Jewish world right now. Don't worry, I'm not going to deliver an op-ed about how to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Or, but I, I do just want to say one or two little remarks about it because um, when I chose the subject of um, the talk, I've not, of course, anticipated, not only not anticipated the catastrophe that happened on October the 7th and which has unfolded ever since, but also I certainly didn't anticipate that one of the most exacting moral issues to face us in extremists would turn on the protection and destruction of hospitals. And that we'd have in the slipstream of all this sorrow a legacy of so many libels against Jewish medicine, so many untold and unknown histories, the part Israeli doctors played in rescuing and treating victims, I'm sure some of you know this, of the Syrian civil war over its long 11-year ordeal, uh, nor that of Arab Israelis, Arab Israelis working, as they have been for many years in Gaza hospitals, with the help of and supplied by their Jewish-Israeli counterparts. I was very upset, though alas not, uh, well I was, I was upset and I was actually shocked and surprised to hear yesterday the death of an absolutely wonderful woman called Vivian Silva, who Canadian-Israeli, many of you I'm sure have read about, um, who was just a kind of saintly figure living in Kibbutz Bieri, uh, who was the founder, co-founder of Women Wage Peace. She was a peace activist between Palestinians and Israelis all her life. She was also a founder of the Arab Jewish Center for Empowerment, Equality, and Cooperation. And she was a very active worker for a wonderful organization, you can find it online, called Derech HaShlema, The Road to Recovery, which was responsible for driving um, really ill people, often needing cancer treatment, from Gaza um, to Israeli hospitals and also hospitals on the West Bank. She was murdered on October the 7th. It was thought that she was a ho um, hostage, she, uh, but she wasn't. Well, as I say, I don't want, I want to pay tribute. Well, I should just add one particularly egregious thing. Um, uh, this, this very morning, uh, which, because it is actually weirdly, an, in, in an unanticipated way, not, not irrelevant to what I want to say, um, for, the, for the remainder of the talk. Um, the BBC, my, you know, I have worked for for 35 years, um, love, I'm devoted to, um, but has not covered itself with glory lately in many respects. And this morning, BBC News had to apologize for mistranslating and misrepresenting a report it got from Reuters which said that it, the IDF entering Al-Shifa Hospital, the main hospital of Gaza City, the IDF was targeting Arabic speakers. It was an odd thing to say, really. Arabic speakers and medical crews, whereas, in fact, the report that Reuters gave accurately was that the IDF was taking into, with them, into Al-Shifa Hospital medical crews to help with the desperate situation of patient suffering and many and plenty of Arabic speakers and interpreters. Anyway, enough of this very heartbreakingly sore point. Um, so as I say, I don't want the, the remarks, don't worry, the remarks that follow will not be a kind of footnote, footnote to the agonized news. Rather, however, I do want to say, which is why I've aired them, um, that any consideration of the vocational obligations and reputational perils of Jews in medicine and clinical science, um, the, the sense necessarily 
engages with the sense that this calling has been not only famously the most highly treasured among Jewish communities, you'll have to come back another time if you want to hear my fantastic treasury of Jewish doctor jokes. Um, okay, well, there's one that you probably all know. <laughs> because, so um, Abe Goldstein, finally a Jewish president, and he phones up his, his elected, as a su surprise candidate to replace Joe Biden. Um, and um, heaven forbid, God forbid. And um, he phones up his mother and says, Mom, you know, are you going to come? And she says, oh, it's a long way. So I said, well, we'll send Air Force One. Okay. I've got nothing to wear. Oh, we have my Neiman Marcus card. So she reluctantly, she shows up. She's sitting on the Capitol steps on the inauguration day. And, um, and uh, her neighbor next to her gets the famous Jewish elbow poke. And uh, the mama says, see that man there? See that man there? She says, yes, yes, his brother is a doctor. <laughs> no, she says, that's all you're going to get tonight. <laughs> let, me, let me turn to the exemplar of some of these paradoxes that, that one of the heroes of, one of the number of heroes of, of my book. Late in 1915, Valdemar Hafkin was in New York shedding a tear at the Yiddish production of Tolstoy's Living Corpse at David Kessler's theater on 2nd Avenue. The great Yiddish actor Jakob Adler, Nesha Hagadol, the great eagle, in the lead role. 17 years earlier than 1915, riding the brief the heights of brief fame in England, Hafkin had been hailed with pardonable hyperbole by Sir Joseph Lister as, quote, the savior of mankind for creating vaccines against cholera and bubonic plague. And as Lister and many others, including Florence Nightingale, still alive, saw it saving the lives of millions of Indians. Now, though, uh, with war in, back to 1915, war raging in Europe, Hafkin had been all but forgotten, though the British government, conscious of the danger it posed to troops and trenches, um, had approached him for advice about developing a vaccine against the great killer of soldiers, typhus. But Valdemar Hafkin in 1915 had lost his vocation as an experimental microbiologist. He'd never really recovered from the unjust accusation of having been responsible for a batch of tetanus contaminated plague vaccine produced by his facility in Bombay that killed 19 people in the Punjab village of Malkawal. In fact, this lethal contamination had taken place on the inoculation site in the village in an open field. That's where the vaccines were done in the poorest parts of India. Um, but Hafkin had paid the price for the disaster. It was said that the contamination had happened, as I said, in his own production facility. Um, which for the, and not least because the catastrophe of Indian natives being killed by a vaccine which had been vigorously promoted by the British government, had, according to the British establishment of the Raj, put the credibility of the Raj at dangerous hazard. The then Viceroy, Lord Curzon, had let it be known, one would generously judge in an unguarded moment, that he wanted Hafkin not merely fired, as he was, but tried, convicted, and hanged, as Curzon wrote, for the offense. Five years later, in uh, in, in 1907, Hafkin, as we'll see a bit later on, was fully exonerated by the British government and offered a job back, but it was not his original position as director of the Plague Research Institute, as it was called, which produced those vaccines. He was given instead a minor job in a small laboratory in the grounds of Calcutta General Hospital. But as Hafkin wrote to his champion, who'd been crucially responsible for his exoneration, Ronald Ross, in 1908, the British authorities in India, civil and medical, had not restored his reputation and authority, quite the opposite, in fact. Nothing has changed, he wrote sorrowfully to Ross. He was still treated as a culpable man, or to put it another way, a figure with a very long history, the unreliable, the dangerously unreliable Jewish healer. 
Have Keynes stayed on in Calcutta for seven years, not doing very much experimentally and even less by way of publishing new research, and he had been a great publisher of all kinds of experimental research in early bacteriology. His passions became escapist, serious thought given to the physics and anatomy of avian flight, for instance. When he did put pen to paper, it was in vindication of his personal scientific history as the pioneer of inoculation against modern, range, uh, modern waves of deadly infectious diseases. He was coolly tolerated by Raj society, Anglo-Indian society in Calcutta, treated occasionally as an eccentric example of the good Jew, snubbed by others who made no secret of their belief that that was an oxymoron. A low point, for me anyway, was when Hafkin put himself through an examination to qualify as a trooper, not even an officer, in the largely ceremonial Calcutta light horse. I wonder whether he ever met up with the Jewish author of Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man, Siegfried Sassoon, and Hafkin did know the Sassoon family very well. In 1915, at the age of 55, he took early retirement, moved back to Paris, or rather to Boulogne-sur-Seine, a, a suburb of Paris, not Boulogne-sur-Mer, where his first great bacteriological breakthrough had taken place at the Institut Pasteur more than two decades earlier. But his passions by this time had swerved dramatically. In April 1916, in his Marylebone apartment, he completed a 12-page essay begun here in New York and sent it to the Journal of American University Jewish Culture, the tablet or the moment of its day. Its title was A Plea for Jewish Orthodoxy. It was reprinted in the London Jewish World and later in the Jewish Chronicle as On Jewish Endurance. In the United States, it was a response to what Hafkin had seen and heard in his encounters with American Jewry, some of them like Horace Callan and Felix Frankfurter, eloquent and learned, but very much reformed Jews. Hafkin had listened to their argument that Judaism, was, uh, that Judaism needed to make an accommodation with modernity, especially technological and scientific modernity and fiercely took the opposite view that what had sustained Judaism and Jewish identity over the millennium, millennia was faithfulness to halakha, to the commandments of the Torah. To slip slide away from those ethical prescriptions, he believed was to put the survival of Judaism in peril. He had not come to the United States as missionary for orthodoxy. His primary interest had been in the agricultural settlements and farms um, promoted by Baron Maurice de Hirsch around the country as part of the program to remake metropolitan urban Jews, pushcart Jews, as Hirsch put it, as cult into cultivators of the soil. Hafkin, who was loosely concerned, uh, con connected with Zionist circles inside and outside Palestine, though never a fully engaged Zionist himself, was interested in seeing if the farmers and herdsmen found room to practice traditional Judaism between milking the cows and hoeing the furrows. Predictably, he was unhappy with what he found in Cumberland and Gloucester counties, New Jersey, the chicken sheds of Utah, and the orange groves of San Joaquin Valley in California. Hafkin's turn to impassioned orthodoxy was perhaps all more surprising since the course of his life in Judaism followed the opposite trajectory to the much more familiar route, you all know, of beginning in the world of the shtetl, in Cheda and Yeshiva, and discovering subsequently the heterodox pleasures of Haskalah emancipation and literature. Hafkin's family in Odessa had mostly been Russian-speaking Haskalah Jews, speaking Hebrew in synagogue and Yiddish scarcely at all. It had been left to Hafkin's maternal grandfather, Itzhak Landsberg, to teach him enough Hebrew to say Kaddish um, at his mother's funeral. In fact, Aramaic, I should say, as you know, Kaddish being an Aramaic prayer, when he was just seven years old, and to give him some educational in traditional, uh, traditional religion. As at the Berdyansk Lycee, his education had been entirely secular, but when he left India, 
many years later, under the cloud of disgrace in 1904, and sent most of his belongings ahead in chests and crates. We know he made sure, this is in the wonderful archive of his papers in the National Library in Jerusalem, we know, we know he made sure that he packed to fill in with himself uh, on the long voyage back to Europe. So he, he wasn't putting his talit, his tefillin, in those crates. He, he was going to wear tefillin every morning when he daven shachrit and so on. When old Jewish friends who'd known him in Odessa student days as not at all orthodox met, met up with him again in France in his retirement, they were surprised to find him benching hamotzi after meals, donikipa, and so on. And some of them, like Hillel Yaffe, um, established in Palestine um, and keen to recruit Hafkin as the head of a new bi microbiological institute in the issue of teased him about his apparent conversion to a strict kosher life. Just when Hafkin had become orthodox, it's quite difficult actually to nail down. One of his great patrons in Bombay, Mumbai now of course, I was finding it very difficult to, to say Mumbai, uh, not only because it was Bombay for the period I'm interested in, but almost any, I've been there many times, many times, a, a number of times, and um, nobody in that city ever says Mumbai to my knowledge. They still actually talk about it as Bombay, maybe you had different. Um, one of his great patrons there, crucial, helped to helping him establish the Plague Research Institute and develop the vaccine and even more critical in persuading her community to accept it was the extraordinary Faha, sometimes known as Flora Sassoon. Business executive, widow, a conscientious follower, such a conscious, conscientious follower of Halakha that she actually employed a traveling private minyan, well, great thing to be able to do, to make sure Shahrit could be said daily. Um, and, um, whose meat, the vast and spectacular banquet she famously threw, was serviced by her own private shochet and were, needless to say, strictly kosher. Nothing in Hafkin's account book says anything at all about the provision of kosher food during his lengthy inoculation odysseys, the length and breadth of India from Kashmir and Assam all the way to the Karnataka, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu. But then if he'd wanted to avoid meat altogether, he could, of course, have merely followed Brahmin vegetarian dietary regime of Thali vegetarian dishes. Though the record of synagogue membership in Bombay is also elusive, there's no doubt that with Faha Sufsun's support, he was instrumental in creating a B'nai Israel plague hospital and hospice in 1897 during the terrifying height of the plague epidemic. In, intended expressly for the Indian Jewish poor of the huge metropolis. And there we do have enthusiastic accounts of his detailed concern for its architectural design, division of labor, construction of the wards, and so on. And appreciative response from the heads of the impoverished community, as well as a, a good deal of appreciative nodding from the much richer Baghdadi Indians, like the Sassoon family themselves. Of Hafskin's sustained fervor for the cause of orthodoxy, but especially traditional religious education, um, a little later there can be no doubt. Ten years after his American journey around those Jewish farms in New Jersey and California, he undertook in 1926-27 a similar expedition in much more challenging circumstances to the Jewish agricultural kolkhozes, the collectives, of southern Ukraine and Crimea, established by the Soviets in a not dissimilar effort from Maurice de Hirsch to transform shtetl Jews into brawny sons of the soil, and with equally mixed results, unsurprisingly, I suppose. Palestine was really the only place where it literally took root. In his endearingly utopian way, Hafkin wanted to make sure that amidst the enthusiasm for tractor maintenance and optimized crop yields, there was also provision for instruction in Torah, Mishnah, Talmud, and so on. And before he died in Lausanne in 1930, he established a foundation launched with his own private money to support yeshivot in Central and Eastern Europe. But Hafki never thought of himself as a conservative, uh, as a reactionary, or even, I think, a conservative in religious matters. 
As he put it in his plea for orthodoxy, the secret of Jewish endurance, its peculiar genius, was in being able to reconcile halakha with the logical and empirical reasoning embodied in science. One of his chapter headings is, quote, old-fashioned kashrut and the up-to-date microscope. And he characteristically makes claims that the dietary laws, however they may have originated, were vindicated by the findings of science. This is a quote from his little essay. Since the advance of the researches in microbiology, it's become known that a remarkable provision for preserving health underlies the thorough removal of the blood from the heart and vascular system of animals intended for food. As immediately following death, the blood is rapidly invaded by microbial, microbial germs and spreads infection throughout the rest of the tissues. Similar provisions are represented in the rejection of carcasses showing tainted tissues, which the microscope has now revealed to be nests of parasitic organisms. In the purification of meat by means of crystal salt, which is a preservative of great potency yet perfectly harmless to man, in the discarding of vessels touched even momentarily by an unclean object, as such a contact suffices to contaminate them with germs of disease, in the sterilization by boiling water or live fire of utensils so contaminated, in short, all the procedures which constitute the orthodox Jewish law. In another, and that's sort of a very familiar line, actually, when people want to um, think about medieval treatises about diet, not least that of Maimonides. They often say, well, it looked forward to ultimately vindicated by empirical reasoning and, and proto-scientific logic. In another tonally quite different, almost mystical uh, passages uh, in the plea for orthodoxy, Hafkin argued that the Almighty is the author of scientific consciousness and the capacity of human reasoning to ascend from material and earthly matters, the constitution of nature, progressively through increased states of enhanced spirituality through which one might apprehend, though never of course entirely capture, the essence uh, of the divine creative force. To study the construction and operation of nature there was to live within the radiant aura of God. And here's Hafkin again. I'm going to remind you of something upstairs in the exhibition, I, I suspect. Alone of all religious and philosophic conceptions of man, the faith which binds together the Jews has not been harmed by the advance of scientific research, but on the contrary, has been vindicated in its profoundest tenets slowly and by degrees passing through innumerable stages in the analysis of the life of animals and plants and of the elemental phenomena of heat, light, magnetism, electricity, chemistry, mechanics, geology, spectroscopy, astronomy, science is being brought to recognize in the universe the existence of one power which is of no beginning and no end and which has existed before all things were formed and will remain in its integrity when all is gone. The source and origin of all in itself beyond any conception or image that man can form and set up before his eye or mind. There is in this meditation some of the Kabbalistic Hasidic adept, albeit a kind of Hasidism light, I think. But of course it recalls deliberately and unmistakably another source entirely of which Hafkin was very definitely aware and which formed the foundation of his belief that not only were halakha and science reconcilable, but that they were mutually and organically connected. The philosophical ascent of sensibilities is reminiscent of the more metaphysical passages in Maimonides' Mora Nevuchim, the Guide to the Perplexed. But it was also Maimonidean Aristotelianism filtered through the abundant body of Arabic philosophical and medical literature, uh, especially Averroes and Abu Sina, Avicenna as he was called um, in Europe, invoked by Maimonides himself, that gave Hafki in his belated conviction that a life in science and a life in faith were or ought to be indivisible. In a more general vocational sense, Hafkin shared the Maimonidean truism 
echoed in his commentaries, Maimonides' his commentaries on the epigrams of Hippocrates, as well as observations in Mishneh Torah, that the understanding of and the practice of medicine were a form of worship, not just, as we would say, a mitzvah to the world, but a path towards the apprehension of God's work in the natural order, a very Aristotelian truism, of course. On the basis of such reasoning, Maimonides wrote, the art of medicine is given a large role with respect to the sovereign virtues, the knowledge of God and the attaining of true happiness. To study it diligently is among the greatest acts of worship. It is then not like weaving or carpentry, since it, medicine, enables us to perform our actions so that they become human leading to virtue and truth. And though Hafkin, to my knowledge, never compared himself directly to Maimonides, um, the medical practitioner, he would surely have recognized a social affinity with a much put upon physician attending to the needs of the non-Jewish powerful, especially, famously, the Abbasid Grand Vizier <coughs> in Cairo, Fajil, to, uh, the Grand Vizier to, um, to the Sultan Caliph Saladin, as well as to Saladin's son, <coughs> as well as to the local Jewish and Gentile community in Fustat, um, a, a, a town some miles away from Cairo, but almost connected to it as a kind of long-distance suburb. In a just, where the Jewish community was concentrated in Egypt in the 11th and 12th centuries. In a justly famous letter, some of you I'm sure have read this, written to the Hebrew translator of the Guide to the Perplex, Shmuel Ibn Tibon, Samuel Ibn Tibon, declining to meet Tibon in person, this is very Moses Maimonides, Tibon very much wanted to meet Maimonides and ask him all sorts of questions that would relate to the Hebrew translation. The, um, uh, the, the, the Guide to the Perplexed was written in Judeo-Arabic, as you know, as were all the, all the medical treatises. Um, <clears throat> even though Tibon was prepared to travel all the way from Provence to Fustat, Maimonides, who according to his great biographer, Moshe Halbertal, um, was uncertain. Maimonides was not absolutely sure whether Tibon was the right man to have the spirit as well as the letter of the Guide to the Perplex correctly. Still, Maimonides excused himself for reasons of scheduling pressure. Uh, oh boy, <laughs> we're often tempted to do this, but we shouldn't do it, really. The stresses and strains of multitasking. Um, for this, of course, actually him you know, spending a lot of time being a physician did not include either his rabbinical duties, he was a great writer of responses, as you know, not to mention his deeply considered philosophical writing. Um, all uh, th this kind of sense that no, I, I can't, I can't see Shmuel Ibn Tibon. I don't care, you know, drew from Maimonides one of the great masterpieces of righteous Jewish fetching, and here, here it is, which some of you know, but I, it can never be read enough. I think I reside at Fustat, and the Sultan resides at um, Kaira, Cairo. These two places are two Sabbaths journey distant from each other. My duties to the Sultan are very heavy. I have to visit him every day early in the morning, and when he or any of his children or any of the inmates of the harem are indisposed, I dare not leave Cairo, but must stay the greater part of the day in the palace. It also frequently happens that one or two of royal officials fall sick, and I must attend to their healing. As a rule, I go to Cairo very early in the day, and even if nothing unusual happens, I can't return to Fustat until the afternoon. Then I'm almost dying of hunger. I love this. I find the antechambers, the waiting rooms, filled with people, both Jews and Gentiles, nobles and common people, judges, bailiffs, friends, foes, a mixed multitude, important phrase in Jewish tradition, who are waiting for the time of my return. I dismount from my animal, I suspect a mule, wash my hands, go forth to my patients, entreat them to bear with me while I partake of some slight refreshment. You imagine the smallest bridge roll, or its equivalent really, the smallest, small, micro bagel. Um, 
the only meal I take in 24 hours. Then I wait on my patients. Patients come and go in and out until nightfall, and sometimes even two hours or more in the night. I talk with them, prescribe for them while lying down from sheer fatigue. And when night falls, I'm so exhausted I can hardly speak. Poor Rambam. While this letter is unique as a report from the routine of the rabbi doctor, some of its vo uh, vocational characteristics would, I think, have been recognized by Maimonides' many famous predecessors as doctors and rabbis, like Chasta ibn Shaprut in 9th century Spain, and by uh, successors later in the centuries as healers of the mighty and humble, all the way to Hafkin himself some seven centuries later. <clears throat> First, the Talmudic Judaic understanding of healing as a version of the restoration of loss. Devarim, Deuteronomy 22.2, stipulates that were one to see a stray domestic animal, there was an obligation to return it to its owner, or if the owner remains unknown, to wait until the owner will come looking for it. The same being true for a donkey or a garment, like a cloak, or anything else lost. The subsequent Talmudic sages, going all the way to Yosef Cairo um, in the early modern period, extended that concept of loss to physical health. So a Jew who had the right skills was under an obligation to restore physical well-being to those that had lost it. It's a rather beautiful idea, I think. In the first instance, Jews, uh, to restore it to anyone, in the first instance to Jews, but not ever confined to Jews. In this way of thinking, the vocations of the rabbi teacher and that of the physician were not only complementary, but virtually indivisible and a whole string of rabbinical physicians as a result followed. Secondly, Maimonides' description of that mixed multitude of all social sorts crowding his waiting room in Fustat presupposes that even physicians to the powerful, in his case, Saladin's grand vizier, were also obliged to diagnose and treat much humbler people. This, too, was a legacy transmitted all the way to 19th century medicine and science, that along with the elite, Jewish doctors had a strong sense of vocation towards the needs of the poor. The first to be vaccinated against cholera, finally I'm going to hope, oh, first turn the clicker on. There we go, and hoping... Uh, there we go, there we go. Um, and I'm gonna come back to this picture, so don't worry if it appears familiar uh, immediately. Um, uh, yeah, the first to be vaccinated against cholera, this is Hafkin vaccinating for cholera in, um, uh, uh, it, it looks like a rustic village, but in fact it's not. It's a, it's a so-called busti in Calcutta, which still exists actually. They're kind of open patches of ground which are leased out by landlords in the huge metropolis to migrant workers. So you can see Vaccine dressed spiffily, as was his wont. He was not only a kind of medical saint, he was an appalling or well, wonderful dandy, depending on your view. And there I want to talk about the people who are surrounding him uh, just a, a little further on, but I want to give a sense of his own sense of actually having a very strong sense of vocation um, among the, the so-called mixed multitude. Um, and I think that, you know, pictures like this, and there was a reason for them, uh, for him to want to keep the photo, which he, which he has several copies of in his personal archive. They have an almost pastoral or missionary quality, as, almost as if enacting one of the Christian seven works of mercy, healing of the sick. Thirdly, in what I take to be a kind of acknowledged affinity, there was a strong sense of the risks as well as the rewards of being a court physician, which in the worst situations could turn into actual mortal peril. The very reason why Jews were sought after as healers, their access, it was thought, to esoteric drugs and simples, a quasi-occult pharmacopoeia, could in some circumstances be also be a trigger for suspicion, especially since many of them, Hasai ibn Shaprut, for example, rabbinical poet, um, minister to Abd al-Rahman III, the caliph of 10th century Andalus, 
owed his initial entree to power by virtue of his being an authority on and dispenser of the so-called theriacum in Latin, the miraculous cure, the miraculous cure-all known to antiquity and mentioned in its uh, medical literature, but since antiquity, the exact recipe lost, other than the fact that it was supposed to be indispens the indispensable ingredient for theriacum was the flesh of vipers. Theriacum could make barren women fertile, impotent men virile, banish falling sickness, give the hard of hearing the alertness of a deer in the forest, this is one description of it, loosen the costive bowel and sharpen the focus of an eye. Ophthalmology actually was another speciality attributed to Jewish medics who wrote a number of treatises on it. Much in the politics of the medieval Islamic world turned on sexual vigor and the prevention of poisonous conspiracy. So that those who might be trusted in both departments of medicine were much sought after. Accordingly, Maimonides provided treatises on both for different patrons in Ayyubid Egypt. The one on coitus, on sex life, being mostly a list of aphrodisiacs supposed to help the potency of a particular patron whose identity we don't know, but who was worried about his decreasing capacity in his abundant harem. We've all been there, really. <laughs> Don't quote me. Um, the treatise, Maimonides' treatise, also a great treatise on poisons, one on natural dangers from mushrooms to minerals, the others on practical treatment in cases of gastric poisoning or the bite of venomous creatures, including yellow scorpions as well as snakes. Very interestingly, actually, one of the things that Hafkin did actually keep on um, investigating in his sort of sad autumnal years in Calcutta were, um, was the whole issue of venom and um, effective antidotes to snake bites, which have become, as you know, absolutely horrendous in India in particular. Um, and actually, the Hafkin Institute, which sort of exists as a slightly archaic museum-like place in Perel in, in Mumbai, um, still has an, an exhibit about um, venom um, and venomous snakes and actually a collection of snakes that are not venomous that children come and see and make faces at. Um, the poison book, Maimonides' poison book, um, which is an amazing thing actually, I don't know if there's a sample of it in, in the exhibition, um, from the many surviving manuscripts in Hebrew, as well as Judeo, Arabic, and Arabic, and later Latin, was, we know now, one of the most frequently circulated, and latterly, when the printing press becomes available, published of all Maimonides' works for a Gentile readership. Crucially, that book on poison seemed to hold the secret to the arbitration of life or death. The trope of the needed, valued, but potentially unreliable Jewish doctor brought with it, uh, brought with it rich rewards, but also deadly hazard, to which more than one suspect grimly succumbed. The most famous case being Elizabeth of, uh, Queen Elizabeth I of England's Portuguese Murano physician, Rodrigo Lopez, accused of aiding a Spanish plot to poison the queen. Elizabeth's then favorite, this is late in the 1590s, the Earl of Essex, himself on the political back foot, seized the opportunity of a campaign of incrimination to shore up his failing political fortunes. All the more determined when he believed Lopez, who was also his doctor, was about to make public his treatment of the Earl of Essex's nasty case of gonorrhea. Lopez confessed under torture, but then immediately recanted, but was nonetheless convicted, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Edward Cook, later a very famous Lord Chief Justice, prosecuting Lopez, drew on all kinds of already ingrained stereotypes, describing Lopez as a perjured, murdering villain a Jewish doctor worse than Judas himself, not a new Christian. Lopez has said, I really am a new Christian, a convert. Not a new Christian, wrote Cook, but a very Jew, and the image of the unreliable um, Rodrigo Lopez certainly played into Marlowe's um, uh, imagination for Barabbas, the Jew of Malta, if not for Shakespeare's Shylock. 
Lopez's case makes, makes it clear that the risks involved when Jewish doctors went beyond their own community to treat powerful Gentile rulers and elites turned into double jeopardy when they lived in the unstable identity world of new Christian Muranos. But in some historical circumstances, that very double identity could be an asset. The expulsion of Jews from Spain and Portugal in 1492 and 1497 brought a whole cohort of physicians who'd been trained in medicine at Coimbra in Portugal and Salamanca in Spain to the Ottoman Turkish Empire, where for some generations they dominated the personnel of court medicine. Mehmet II, the conqueror of Constantinople, had a Jewish body of physician, as did Suleiman the Magnificent, and the person, famous person of Moses Hamon, brought originally as a three-year-old child to Constantinople by his Jewish physician father. Under Selim I and Suleiman, the corps of doctors at Topkapi Palace counted 43 non-Jews and 61 Jews, a number which did indeed decline at the end of the 16th century, not least because some of them were said to have been implicated in palace plots. But the forthrightness with which fugitive new Christians, Muranos, reverted to outright Judaism once they were in the Ottoman world actually helped dispel the suspicion of double dealing in drugs and false antidotes, seeing that they were nothing to lose uh, as a result of professions of candor. The great case in this respect was that of Eliyahu Montalto, Elijah Montalto, physician originally as a new Christian to Maria de' Medici, Maria de' Medici, the queen of King Henry IV of France. Originally, Montalto's appointment was conditional on the fact that he claimed to be a new and a, a devout new Christian Catholic. But even though his status and safety were threatened when an erstwhile friend of the queen turned plotter against her, a woman called Leonora Galigai, and she implicated Montalto in her friend as knowing about whatever intrigue she was up to. Montalto's services were deemed so indispensable by, by Maria de' Medici that he was able to rewrite the terms of his own contract, including, astonishingly, a demand, not just a request, but a demand to be allowed to publicly practice the Judaism to which he had conspicuously reverted, and so indeed he did. In fact, actually, when he died, eventually, his body, the queen paid for his body to be buried in the Jewish, expressly Jewish cemetery outside Amsterdam at Oudekerk. When experimental science, rather than traditional medicine, especially, um, especially the old medicine, was based on the Hippocratic Galenic canon, made claims to healing, and its advocates were Jews or Muranos, the calculus between opportunity and risk took on a wholly new dimension. In 1721, the Murano medically educated at Coimbra, Jose Castro to Sarmiento, established, again reverting to Judaism, in London, um, and published his dissertation on inoculating for the smallpox. Um, and it was a really startling and brave thing for him to do. There's a lot in foreign bodies about just how to, how incredibly counterintuitive inoculation with the smallpox was. It's the first time, really, in the history of medicine that people were asked to believe that actually inviting toxic matter, pus from a smallpox victim, a live smallpox victim, and injecting it into your arm or rubbing it on your abraded arm or foot, bringing on an attack of smallpox, but one so mild that it would prevent you from dying rather than expedite your death. This is the first time it was done. And there were very important other people involved in promoting what was a dramatically, as you might imagine, controversial procedure. Sarmento already had a reputation and practice in England for promoting special and dramatic cures, namely the potion he called Agua de Inglaterra, English, English water, that was supposed to heal, a bit like theriacum, any number of ills and maladies. Before his pamphlet on smallpox was published, um, as I say, the startlingly counterintuitive inoculating the healthy, especially when it was given to children, 
um, had already been introduced in England by two Greco-Italian physicians, Emanuele Timoni and Giacomo Pilarini, who sent their observations to the Royal Society in 1714 and 15, and much more famously and extraordinarily by the wife of the British ambassador in Constantinople, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, herself the survivor of a terrible attack of smallpox, who inoculated her six-year-old son while still in Turkey and her three-year-old daughter on returning to England. Attacks by the shocked and outraged are what seemed the act, as they said, of an unnatural mother inviting infection into the body of healthy children. Um, on the say-so of practitioners of what one of them said was a scarcely literate land, meaning Turkey, um, and a woman doing this as well emphasized the alien foreign nature of the case histories that the champions of inoculation were publicizing to promote their case. Now, when a Jew did this, when Sarmento added to the inoculation literature, it took no time at all for his Jewish identity to be invoked as yet another reason to resist this dangerous innovation. No one needed to invoke myths of Jews poisoning the wells to suggest that the medical word of a Jew ought not to be trusted in any matter of speculative treatment. This did not preclude Sarmento going on, however, to be accepted as an authority, briefly, on these matters, and elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1730, possibly because the Royal Society, rather surprisingly, was an amazingly forward and outward-looking um, institution, prepared to listen to and understand case histories that came from far beyond England. In fact, I think the sort of prejudices against foreign advice about how to treat infectious diseases became more parochial in the 19th century than they had been in the 18th. So here um, is, um, yeah, so here again, uh, now we can turn back to, and nice AV person said don't turn around completely, I think I'm on camera or something which, as you know, I hate. No, don't really love it. Um, here, then, is Hafkin, the very paradigm of experimentally ambitious, socially and morally conscious bringer of clinical benevolence into the very heart of the British Raj. In 1895, vaccinating the children of this Calcutta Busti, which may, I'm not completely convinced of this, been a place called Katal Bagan against cholera. Hafkin was also the paradigmatic outsider being a Ukrainian Jew held at arm's length by the imperial medical establishment in India, not just because of that suspicious mixed identity, but because he had no medical degree. He had a distinguished, very distinguished PhD in the new discipline of microbiology. It didn't help, as far as the medical establishment in India was concerned that his training had been in Russia and France at the Pasteur Institute at a time when Russians were assumed to be up to no good on the Afghan, Afghan frontier, plus ça change. And Britain and France were locked in imperial competition that extended into a contest of science and medicine. Stories appeared in Calcutta newspapers that Hafki might be some sort of Russian spy. There was another reason, too, movingly documented in this photograph, I think, why Hufkin, the bringer of a prophylactic vaccine against cholera, should have been treated with indifference or outright suspicion. The Indian assistants attending the scene. Um, not just the medical inspector of Calcutta, who you see there, um, but also, um, who's called Mr. Gian Mukherjee, but also, uh, no, excuse me, the, med yes, uh, the medical inspector is that, that's Mr. Mukherjee. Um, and, but also the uh, Jagendra Dutt, uh, Dutt, analyst of the city health department, that's that gentleman there, and you can see there's another Indian assistant whose name I've forgotten, I'm ashamed to say. That, by the way, is Hafkin's great champion, William Ritchie Simpson. Um, this was extremely unusual. This is a different kind of mixed multitude. And these Indians were there as linguistic interpreters, but very importantly, um, reassuring persuaders of the fearful. You can see how nervous these very poor people are about what's going on. Hafkin only took volunteers, by the way. There's 
that's another very complicated story about the kind of populations that he vaccinated and who the volunteers were. But it was exactly at this time that the establishment of the British Raj was sensitive to the degree to which Indians ought to claim a share of the material benefits it said had been gifted to its subjects by virtue of the superiority of Victorian civilization. So that a deliberate campaign of training and co-option, very much the sort of thing that Hafkin did, was treated in some quarters as the public health equivalent of jumped up local Indian councils comprised of over the over-educated classes, the babus as they were called, challenging the monopoly of Saib authority in British India. But without anything in the way of official support and funding, just, assist, just an assistant from the Pasteur Institute days, an Englishman called, English um, biologist called Ernest Hankin, um, who'd been put in charge of a biology lab in Agra, Hafkin worked on with strictly volunteer populations, military cantonments where he inoculated native troops, schools and prisons, uh, the brutally exploited so-called coolies of the tier states of Assam. Hafkin traveled thousands of miles through India. His description of his daily routine in, in all sorts of ways, I think, is reminiscent of that of Maimonides 700 years earlier, both in its presumption of a kind of social, inclusive mission, as well as the duties of the custodians of healing knowledge towards the modest as well as the mighty. Hafkin... Um, in a letter described his little crew working, quote, under a burning sun with en without any other shade than an umbrella, no umbrella here, uh, uninterrupted from the hours before dawn to mid-morning, then back to the lab to prepare more vaccine for the next wave of inoculations, and then in the evening around 4 or 5 p.m. till very late at night. In the absence of much support, official support, from the Indian civil serv and medical service, Hafkin depended not least for funds on wealth, wealthy and often princely patrons. In Bombay, on the young Aga Khan, and as I've said, Faha Sassoon, the Aga Khan, who was only 19 years old and who became a great close friend of Hafkin's, um, actually gave him the run of one of his lodges, palatial lodges, to set up a vaccine-producing laboratory before the British government would actually agree to it themselves. But British suspicion and standoffishness would have been even more acute had its officials known that the Russian state security police had a bulging file on the earlier career. There, I'll come back to that beautiful photo a bit later. Um, uh, uh, towards the end. Here's an image of the young Hafkin as a student at Odessa University. Hafkin had, in fact, in the early 1880s, been a member of the populist organization, the People's Will, Narodie Volia, a group that assassinated Tsar Alexander II. Uh, Hafkin had nothing to do with that, not known about it. And more daringly, and very importantly in Jewish history, I think, had been among the student defense force who for the first time in Jewish history distributed weapons, including guns, to the Odessa Jewish community against the inevitably oncoming pogroms following the Tsar's death in 1881. Caught three times, twice for carrying pistols on his own person, jailed three times, he'd been rescued from serious trouble, only by the intervention of his biology professor, himself an extraordinary maverick figure, Ilya Mechnikov, from a converted Jewish family who had the necessary connections in St. Petersburg. It was when Mechnikov, himself compromised by exactly those interventions, moved to Paris in the initial year of the Institut Pasteur in 1888-89, that he brought Hafkin there in a lowly position and to the opportunity that ended in his students' effective and safe vaccine against cholera. Hafkin developed it while he was there um, at the Pasteur Institute. He arrived in Paris in the centennial year of the French Revolution, and the Exposition Internationale laid out on the Champ de Mars and in the Trocadero before in front of the brand new Eiffel Tower. Hafkin's notebooks were not bursting with exacting details of the experiments he had to set up for the world's first course in microbiology. 
were full of rapturous quotations from French literature and history. You get the strong impression that, though, uh, that back in Odessa, although Mechnikov back in Odessa had extracted from him a promise to concentrate exclusively on science and give up the dangers of politics, Hafkin, who had no idea that he was being spied on by Russian secret police in Paris, always thought of his work as socially humane, though not yet a religious discipline. And he carried this essentially altruistic connect conviction through uh, all his vaccination campaigns in India, not least in the obligation to persuade and reassure the poor at, whoa, sorry, let me see if I can get that back. There we are. There's a, a wonderful picture of him. Again, such a kind of documentary photograph. He's vaccinating people, this time through bubonic plague, in the streets of Bombay. Um, you can, he's the figure, as you might, um, there in the fifth helmet. There, very interestingly, under the umbrella, if you can just see her, is one of the people he was proudest of, actually, training up. A, one, a woman uh, biologist doctor called Alice Courthorn, about whom we know quite a lot, who was responsible for an intensive vaccination. Again, bubonic plague, by the way, was incredibly hor horrifying. It killed nearly 30 million people. We've forgotten about it, actually, as one of the great world pandemics between 1892 and the late 1920s. So Hafkin's invention of a plague vaccine was really extraordinarily profound. Um, when he came, so, um, yes, uh, carried this essentially altruistic conviction through to these kinds of campaigns, um, often helped by the endorsement of elite rulers with whom he came into direct contact. So when he came into ink to England to go back to this beautiful portrait of him by a very interesting woman photographer called Angelina Ackland, um, am I moving away? Am I moving? Okay. Oh, I'm about to. Yeah, I've done that before. <laughs> I'm famous for teetering on the brink and uh, s just to, you know, make you all very excited, lest you fall asleep. Although I'm not hearing any snoring yet. I'm nearly done, actually. Here he is actually in 1899, but you get the sense that he was actually an extraordinary, briefly, as I said, almost a medical celebrity. He comes back to England after his cholera campaign of thousands of miles from length and breadth of India. But he contracted malaria, a terrible case of malaria, in Assam. He was seen by his most ardent admirers among the great and good of medicine and science as the opposite, the opposite of the unreliable, perhaps even mountebank Jewish physician. Instead, he was seen by his admirers in England in strong contrast to the way he was thought of in India as the personification of the good Jew, a kind of medical Daniel Deronda. No wonder the likes of Florence Nightingale, still alive, sought him out. Hafkin, for at least a brief moment, was on the verge of becoming an eminent late Victorian. The romanticism surrounding him reached the level of a kind of philo-Semitic philo epiphany, those were the days, in the summer of 1899, when Sir Joseph Lister proposed a toast to him at a dinner at the Maccabean Society, still in existence, by the way, at a restaurant in St. James's, definitely. I've researched this, not kosher. <laughs> Hafkin's heroic reputation as a toiler for social good had reached new heights as he had developed this vaccine for bubonic plague. As usual, the imperial medical establishment was fighting the last war, uninterested in the new bacteriology, the last war being the campaign against cholera, which was essentially a campaign, of course, of disinfection. Disinfection had no effect on bubonic plague because of its etiology. Um, they were uninterested in the bacteriology and certainly uninterested in the account um, that Alexandra Yersin, who um, Hafkin had known uh, in Paris, identification of the plague bacillus in Hong Kong in 1894. In contrast, the official Bombay approach was one of maximum military style inspection and disinfection, hauling passengers, of course poor Indian passengers, off trains to examine them for signs of buboes, forcing entries into houses and streets, power sluicing those houses with carbolic acid solution separating families, shocking Indian sensibilities by having men examine women for signs of the infection in groins and armpits, 
with the predictable result of a violent backlash, including strikes, attacks on plague hospitals, and in the most dramatic case, the assassination of the chief public health officer in Pune as he was exiting a celebration of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. Hafkin's plague vaccine had been developed in a few rooms at Grant Medical College, then courtesy after that, as I said, of young Aga Khan. Only finally, um, only finally, um, in 1899, three years after he'd come to Bombay from Calcutta in response to an urgent request, did the government decide to support him fully in establishing a so-called Plague Research Institute in the building at Parel. You can see it's uh, had a former life as a very grand official, actually a residence of the governor of Bombay um, and subsequently the administration in Perel in the south of the city. That's where the Hafkin so-called institute still is. Um, it was there that Hafkin established the world's first facility for the mass production of any kind of vaccine, beginning with thousands and then tens of thousands of doses per day. You're looking at a photograph of the incubation chamber to be sent with traveling vaccination teams across the continent where plague was most severe. Riding high on this reputation and at the invitation of the Royal Society, Joseph Lister was its president, Hafkin went back to London in the summer of 1899. That's where the Maccabean dinner happened. At the dinner, Lister, making the toast to Hafkin very movingly, went out of his way not just to praise Hafkin to the skies as a scientist, but to make explicitly that contrary to the vicious law of anti-Semites depicting Jews as mercenary parasites, the Jews, as Lister almost embarrassingly put it, were the noblest, the most idealistic, the most scientifically ingenious culture the world had ever seen. The British and their empire in particular had every reason to be grateful to them. Visibly and audibly moved, Hafkin, who'd prepared remarks describing the development of his vaccines, shifted tone and narrative, recalling the months and years, both at the Pasteur Institute and then in India, when initially he'd received no support at all. A dark time, he said, that had brought absolute despair on him to the point of contemplating suicide as a way out. But, he said, what had restrained him from this desperate act was his strong sense that he was almost prophetically an emissary of the millions he'd left behind in Ukraine, Russia, and Eastern Europe, who would somehow share the credit with him for having brought a benefit to mankind. Startlingly, he turned directly to Lister, sitting beside him, and asked him whether in their many encounters his being Jewish was much on Lister's mind. Lister answered immediately in the affirmative, to which Hafkin, almost incredulous, repeated the question with Lister actually shouting yes in response as all the diners in their dinner jackets, the great and good of Anglo Jewry, wrapped their hands on the tables in applause. Genuinely moving moment. This intercultural honeymoon did not last. Notwithstanding the staggering achievement of turning out, in the end, millions of doses of the plague vaccine, inoculating throughout India and exporting the vaccine to other regions of Asia, Malaya and uh, uh, southeast um, uh, uh, Cochin China, French area of interest, as well as uh, areas of Africa, Australia, and even California. Hafkin's fall from grace following that tetanus disaster in the Punjab village was hastened by the return of all the ancient tropes about the unreliable Jewish clinician, the Jew who came as healer, but who was actually a poisoner. At stake was what seems, in historical retrospect, an absurd imperial nationalist refusal to accept that the disinfectant of British choice, carbolic, was inadequate, and that and it was called this French method of sterilization recommended by Louis Pasteur's protocols um, was actually superior, more reliable. 
Hath Keen had already been suspected of replacing carbolic acid sterilization protocol by Pasteurian heat without getting agreement from the local public health authorities in Bombay. In fact, Hath Keen insisted correctly, he had written to them asking them precisely that, and when he got no reply at all, went ahead with the much more reliable heat sterilization, pasteur pasteurization in effect. The calamity in the village, it turned out, actually turned on exactly that point. The preparer of the vaccine had dropped the forceps used to extract the India rubber stopper from the flask and had sluiced the instrument briefly in a solution of carbolic acid instead of passing forceps through the heat as Hafkin's own printed instruction had required. These were details which only became evident after Hafkin had been fired from his post as director of the Plague Research Institute, his career and life broken on this miscarriage of justice, which he and others directly compared, and not, I think, with vaingloriousness, to the Dreyfus case. In fact, uh, working in the archive in, um, in Jerusalem, I discovered cuttings that Hafkin had made of the Dreyfus proceedings. Um, he kept them in his personal papers. Much of the hue and cry, especially in British India itself, turned consciously or unconsciously on Hafkin's status as a marginal outsider, a foreign body. While there was no overtly uh, anti-Semitic defamation, nothing needed decoding about references to his untrustworthy foreignness, his lack of a medical degree, his Russian origins. Such a person, it was said, ought never to have been entrusted with the work of high importance for the credibility of the Raj. This was said in correspondence between Bombay and Calcutta and Whitehall. He had let down not just himself, the cause of vaccination, but the authority of the benevolent Raj. Hence Curzon's comment, it was not the only such comment, by the way, that for such crimes he ought to be tried, convicted, and hanged. Conversely, for Hafkin's champions, William Richard Simpson, who I showed you earlier, um, and more significantly for Ronald Ross, who would win the Nobel Prize um, for establishing the connection between the parasitical pathogen inside the gut of Anopheles mosquitoes and malaria. Conversely, they cast their cause as an exoneration, it's very reminiscent of Trophius, I think, of the unjustly mistreated Jew, the altruistic healer condemned without proper evidence as a dangerous charlatan. In this way, just as the cause of Dreyfus became a kind of litmus test for the strength of democratic justice in the French Third Republic, the much less well-known cause of Hafkin became a comparable test of the British Empire's embrace or rejection of bacteriology when its application was in the hands of a figure outside of the usual profile of the Indian civil and medical service. Hafkin got a job back, as I said earlier on, that small lab in the grounds of the Calcutta General Hospital, was, a, was kept, from, uh, kept at a strict distance from anything to do with vaccine production. This broke him. But every so often, something would happen which made him disregard the cold shoulders, the sneers, and the suspicions. In 1908, a cholera epidemic broke out in the coal mining community of Jaria, 200 kilometers northwest from Calcutta. Hundreds of miners and their families were dying. Hundreds more had fled. Bodies were lying unburied on roads and in fields. Feral dogs were loping into houses, human limbs and remains between their jaws. The company and the miners themselves were desperate to be vaccinated. Hafkin, notwithstanding the prohibition, on his vaccination program was called on by the company, not by the local government, who didn't like this at all, to help. Hafkin, in turn, asked his old students and assistants in Calcutta for supplies which were provided, but without any of them being allowed to go in person to Jaria. So Hafkin went himself, quite alone, fraught with anxiety about the condition of the vaccine itself, Malkawal, and what had happened was very much on his mind, I'm sure. This final photograph exists of him. This is the last photograph of him at work at Jaria. Inadvertently, 
and beautifully recording a kind of double exposure. The mine's chief medical officer not being clearly an expert in shutter speeds. So the unreliable Jewish vaccinator is caught both, as you can see, I hope, concentrating entirely on the task at hand, vaccinating, and then not very happily breaking off to pose briefly for the photographer, his expression one of reluctant but inevitable obligation to his fellow men, his vocation, and his God, which is surely something the exhausted, indomitable Maimonides would definitely have understood. Thank you. Yeah. very much for a fascinating tour of Maimonidean influence and impact across the centuries. And I think that's particularly resonant for all of us, having just lived through a pandemic that we never anticipated. Um, I'm going to invite the audience, if anyone has questions, to fill in cards and pass those to Ben. Ben, on the side. Um, ben has extra cards that people need. And um, we'll try to have a few questions um, as we move forward. Yeah. This one here. Um, so the question was asked about the terminology from Murano and Converso oh. and its usage. It's sorry, it, it's the same. Murano actually um, was an insult, actually. Um, yeah, coined. Um, um, and but New Christian was what. Um, the converts, whether they were uh, serious about their conversion or not. I mean, it's, um, uh, it, it became an excruciating point in the century between the horrible, violent massacres of Jews at the end of the 14th century in cities like Seville and Cordoba, um, and um, uh, uh, this enormous, you know, very large Jewish community in, in Spain, and what had been Muslim Spain and also in Christian Spain, divided into three about 100,000 each. I mean, there was an extraordinary number of people who were murdered in those Easter riots in 1391. It was one of the absolutely great traumatic moments in Jewish history. It's not well enough known. The other two are divided into those who remain Jewish and those who converted. Um, they were almost in equal thirds, so far as one can actually collect even something even remotely resembling reliable demographic statistics. The new Christians, so-called, the conversos, were then the major target of the Inquisition. The Inquisition was then deeply suspicious, in, in some cases correctly, about whether or not the new Christians, how Christian they genuinely were. So they were the ones who were targeted, uh, interrogated, in some cases tortured, and if discovered to have been, quote, in the words of the time, Judaizing, were put on the auto da fe or, or given, put through another treatment to make sure the Christian, that the, the forthrightly Jewish community was the one that was expelled from Spain in 1492. But I use the term confusingly, interchangeably. So I have a question about Hafkin's kind of life journey. So how did he right. arrive in India from and right. the, the stages of his life? Right, right. Um, it, it's a long and interesting, well, not too long, interesting story I, I write about in, in the book. That's a cheap shot to get you to buy it, really. But I will tell you, I'll tell you anyway, I'll give you the short version. Um, you know, he it was an extraordinary, he had an extraordinary position in, in, in at the Pasteur Institute. Uh, Mechnikov, when he brought him there in 1889, couldn't get him a real position. There were no positions, really, very few positions as junior researchers. Um, so he got a, a job, he was always getting very menial jobs, and the job he got in Paris was an, an assistant librarian. Um, but it was when Yersin, who was the discoverer later of the plague bacillus, bacillus, who had been the preparateur for that famous course in microbiology, the first in, in the history of science, suddenly left and to become a ship's doctor um, in Vietnam. 
that Hafki not got the opportunity to become the préparateur. It was actually not, Pasteur was in semi-retirement by that time, paradoxically. The great course was being delivered by his number two, Emile Roux. And uh, when Hafkin then got into lab work, essentially, if labs were open to him, so he worked really at night. It was one of these heroic things. And he decided really to do what was thought to be impossible, to develop a safe and effective cholera vaccine. And he was the first person to try it out on himself. And 60 of his incredibly trusting friends, Russian, <laughs> Russian and, and Jewish friends in Paris, um, but the answer to your, to your question, Gabriel, is that it happened to be, this was, uh, the, the fact is cholera was receding as it had been the great killer, as I'm sure you all know, in 19th century Europe. It was ebbing quite swiftly, although not disappeared entirely. It was another, the last great ferocious comeback in Europe was in Hamburg in 1896. Uh, but Hafkin, something I didn't say in the talk, um, already had an instinct that you'd only really know if you could do what we now call randomized comparative trials. In other words, you had a trial population in which person A had the vaccine, person B did not, and person C had the vaccine, person D didn't, and they were all came from more or less socially identical backgrounds. So that's why he went to uh, prisons and hospitals and military cantonments and to the, you saw a kind of longhouse in the Calcutta Busti where there were 20 or 30 people who'd lived in identical circumstances. So he knew he had to go to Asia where cholera, in some parts of which was endemic, but in the big cities, it was a, a brutal epidemic. And the last but crucial point is that at that time, we're now in 1892, the summer of 1892 was when he demonstrated on himself and his friends the cholera vaccine. Anybody had the cholera vaccine? It's pretty much actually as, like, as Hafkin made it. it uh, and first time I went to film in India, I had a cholera vaccine. It hurts, actually, I can tell you. You don't feel so good for 36 hours. Um, then it's just fine. Um, uh, uh, the, the British ambassador was a man called Viscount Dufferin, who'd been Viceroy of India. Um, and his wife, a really interesting woman called Harriet Dufferin, was one of the pioneers of medical education in India for women and created a fund um, <coughs> um, in order to provide money for the education of Indian women to become doctors. It was Dufferin who uh, recommended Hafkin to the Secretary of State for India in London, in fact sent him to London in November 1892, uh, giving Hafkin the impression that when he went out to Kolkata, in 1893, he would be fully supported financially, which was absolutely not the case. All he actually had was a kind of passepartout letter saying, any of you in any of these towns or villages kindly give Mr. Hafkin the possibility of going about his work. So um, that's, how, that's, how he got, that's how he got to India. But he became a, a, a sort of romantic about India, really, as many people were and are, including me, I think. Um, um, he, he was absolutely kind of in love with, with all of Indian culture. <laughs> so this, yes, you kind of suggested this issue of the vilification and anti-Semitic trope right. of the Jewish medical expert or doctor as kind of viewed into our own time. We have a right. question that asks that about how the CEO of Pfizer and others, um, both, Albert Bula. Yes, yeah, both for about? COVID and during, also during the AIDS yeah. crisis. Yeah. Um, and he, they wonder, like, what would Hafkin, or I would say even Maimonides, have thought of this situation? They would have reckoned, if we're talking about really not trusting, you know, I mean, part of the, part of the grotesquely coarse attack on um, pharmaceutical corporations, the sense in which there's a kind of hidden hand of pharma pharmaceutical conspirators, really, is just a tiny bit removed, it's kind of the protocols of the pharma pharmaceutical industry of Zion, really, and it's more <laughs> grotesque aspects. Albert Bullard is so interesting. I do want to meet him. I have a mutual friend. I haven't. Uh, Bullard is a Salonika Jew who was educated at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, which I, many of you, uh, some of you may know was built on the ruins of the Sephardi Cemetery at Salonika, which was not destroyed by the Nazis. It was actually destroyed by an interwar Greek government. The Nazis actually finished the job during the war. So he was literally, Bula, who was trained as a veterinarian doctor, actually, 
got his education over the remains of the ghosts of his Sephardi community. We have a question about kind of Jewish medical involvement in England, um, in the UK. Um, when were Jews first kind of trained officially and Jewish involvement as, med as doctors to the court or to high ranking elites? Right, right. Um, not early on, actually. I mean, I think there are, there are a number of um, interesting uh, figures, Ve a small number, I'd say, working on microbiological experiments um, uh, in uh, towards the 18, 1870s and 1880s, not before then. Um, so they I, I, they weren't prevented. There weren't. I mean, we never know, you know, if there are kind of silent quotas. But by the time of that Maccabean dinner in 1899, they were very well established in most branches of experimental as well as um, practical clinical medicine. But you know, was there a sort of strong sense of um, esprit de corps among Jewish doctors expressly, not really aware of that, but it may just be I don't know about that, which is a good question. And we were asked kind of about the recognition of Rafkin. You've talked about his recognition in France and right. elsewhere in India. They asked also about in Eastern Europe, in Russia or Ukraine, was, do they claim him as their own or reject him? Um, the Jews in Ukraine and Russia, do we mean, or were we talking about Jews? Oh. Um, no, it was certainly not the authorities. What's very interesting, actually, is that um, bef before he went to India, before he took up Dufferin's offer to go to India, Hafkin thought, because actually one place uh, sort of, you know, on, on the, the gates between Asia and, um, and Europe was, of course, um, Russia, particularly the area, the notoriously f most ferocious hot zone was on the area north of the Caspian Sea, really, between Iran, between Persia and Russia. And, um, and there were still notoriously ferocious outbreaks of incredibly devastating uh, waves of cholera. So Hafkin actually wanted to uh, do his first randomized trials and an uh, intensive campaign of cholera vaccination in Russia. And, it, uh, and in fact, um, Pasteur himself wrote as well as Hafkin, wrote to the uh, Ministry of Health in St. Petersburg, but the Ministry of Health immediately sort of had to check out the status of Hafkin with the state security authorities, at which point this enormous dossier on the uh, politically dangerous radical young Hafkin came into play. Um, I, and there was a kind of cringy letter written by the Duke of Oldenburg back to Pasteur saying, notwithstanding the potential of this young man. It ain't gonna happen. So, um, um, uh, Hafkin goes back, as I said in the talk, to visit the kolkhozes, Jewish kolkhozes, the Jewish kibbutzim in effect, in U absolutely where the war zone is now, in southern Ukraine and Crimea, um, long established community, trying to get, uh, make sure there'd be a foothold for religious education as well as interested in seeing whether they're viable. In the end, it turned out not to be, but... Um, uh, but um, there, in, in fact, um, he, w he wasn't... He also went to see his family, who he hadn't seen for a long time, his sister and one of his brothers and so on, traveled quite far into communities, Jewish communities in Siberia. They, they, they didn't really know much about him, uh, uh, even by the 1920s. Um, but he, what, there, are, there are elements of his reputation um, did precede him. Um, one of the people we know wrote about Hafkin during the um, ferocious outbreak of the plague in Russia in 1898, and that was Anton Chekhov, actually, um, who wrote to a friend of his saying, we don't have to be frightened of the plague anymore because this, um, he actually, Chekhov says, the quotations in the book, uh, Chekhov says, um, uh, it said, uh, famous in England, um, but characteristically and outrageously unknown in Russia. Um, so, so he knew about Hafkin, so it's, but it's quite hard to get a sense. I, he was certainly not as well known in Russia, as either in the Jewish or non-Jewish community. He was embraced by the Jewish community in Russia, in Petersburg and Moscow. So two final questions. Um, one is kind of closer to home, perhaps, for someone here. So you've talked about the you know, Hirsch organizations and right. you've talked about Sassoon family. But were you familiar with the Rato Clinic in Mumbai, Bombay? And someone's grandfather in the audience was born there. So that, oh, okay. Uh, the Rothschilds in Bombay. Rothschild Clinic. 
Oh, no, I don't. I don't. No, okay. tell me about, I didn't know about that. Thank right. you. Tell me about and then that. someone has asked, which I think we you proved the answer, which is, um, this, why is Hafkin such a forgotten figure in medical and, and Jewish history, and what should be done about it? Clearly, you've written a book, so um, and are speaking. <laughs> but do you have a can you conjecture why it's lesser known? You know, it is. But there was a book written. Uh, there were two biographies in um, the sixties. One by Samuel Waxall, who's himself a scientist and uh, developed developer um, developed antibiotics. Um, that was the first biography. Um, and Maxwell does, actually doesn't say how he got interested in Hafkin, but the book is, um, it, it's, it's a, a slight volume and it is full of inaccuracies. It thinks, for example, that Hafkin came from a, a shtetl background or it, and transferred to Odessa and his father was a Malamed teacher, which he wasn't at all. He was a commercial traveler who worked for the Gunsberg family. So it's sort of unreliable. Um, and then there was a very interesting book, a very anecdotal, written by a Soviet Jewish journalist who immigrated to New York called Mark Popovsky. And Popovsky talked to um, a number of surviving members of, of Hafkin's own family, actually. And that's where, and he also looked at the state security records, which is how we were able to reconstruct the really extraordinary story of this group of young Russian Jewish students who armed. Um, the Jews of Odessa in defense against the pogroms. So, but they then, I don't know, sort of, you know, um, uh, the, the, I, th I think because actually, you know, those particular, the two particular vaccines, particularly the plague vaccine, was superseded by various strains of antibiotic bases, and, the, and also, you know, the vaccine program was interrupted by the catastrophe at Malkawal and um, never got a foothold again. So in India, he remained in India and only in India, his name became, remained famous. And in 1925, um, an, an English head of the Plague Research Institute um, lobbied all who had to be lobbied to rename that Institute of Perel the Hafkin Institute. And so, you know, that name is, is, is much more widely known in India than anywhere else. So on behalf of Yeshiva University Museum and on behalf of the Center for Jewish History, and on behalf of everyone here in the room and everyone watching online, yes, we enthusiastically applaud and thank Sir Simon for joining us this evening. I want to remind you, those of you here in the auditorium, that Sir Simon will be available to sign books and to purchase There's books for sale outside as you first exit. Um, we're going to journey from Maimonides to Hafkin and back to Maimonides. So there will be an exhibition tour once again for any of you who had signed up or those of you who wish to join. Um, and those of you who have not seen our exhibition and can't make it here tonight, I welcome you and encourage you to come see our exhibition on Maimonides to really understand Maimonidean across the centuries, which is the storyline of the exhibition. And once again, our great thanks to Sir Simon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.